I thought through this life, my time would be my own. The step I now am taking's for eternity alone. No need to be the wiser, through time I shall be free, and as the past hath been, the future still will be. To my guileless heart, all free from worldly care, and full of blissful hopes and youthful visions rare, the world seemed bright, the threatening clouds were kept from sight, and all looked fair, but pitying angels wept. They saw my youthful friends grow shy and cold, and poisonous darts from slanderous sacrifice. Thou didst not weigh the cost, nor know the bitter price. Thy happy dreams all o'er thou'dst doomed, alas, to be, barred out from social scenes by this thy destiny. And o'er thy saddened memories of sweet departed joys, thy sickened heart will brood and imagine future woes. And like a fettered bird with wild and longing heart, thou'lt daily pine for freedom and murmur at thy lot. But couldst thou see the future and view that glorious crown awaiting you in heaven, you would not weep nor mourn. Pure and exalted was thy father's aim, and he saw a glory in obeying this high celestial law. For to thousands who've died without the light, I will bring eternal joy and make thy crown more bright. I'd been taught to revere the prophet of God and receive every word as the word of the Lord. But had this not come through my dear father's mouth, I should ne'er have received it as God's sacred truth. Helen Mar Kimball I am Ryan McKnight. I'm Kara Santa Maria. I am Christopher Smith. Hi, I'm Andrew Torres. This, this is Naked Mormonism. Mormonism, the Serial Mormon History Podcast. Today's show will be focused on one person. You heard her at the top, Helen Mar Kimball. Helen's story has been told a number of times in a number of places, and every time that story is it's all taken from the same sources. I'm going to be relying on those same sources to tell her story here because those sources are from her own hand. Helen Mar Kimball Smith Whitney. She's an interesting figure in Mormon history. She was the youngest of all of Joseph Smith's wives, but so often she's only boiled down to just that Joe's 14 year old wife, but she's so much more than a common jab at the supposed piety of the prophet. She was a faithful member of the church her whole life. She was an advocate for polygamy while wrestling her own internal conflicts concerning the practice. Her entire family were some of the highest regarded members of the Mormon elite. She had 11 children in her 68 years of vital life. She was a prolific writer and, as you heard before, an occasional poet. She authored two pamphlets defending the practice of this new and everlasting covenant of Mormon polygynous marriage. She loved music and dancing, and she respected her parents even through disagreements that she had with them. She was allowed by church leaders to marry for love, but only for time, not for eternity. Her daily life and eternal destiny were co-opted and spoken for long before she had any say in what her own future held. She also played the hand that she was dealt and did so masterfully. But time and time again, Helen Mark Kimball is reduced to an attack point against Joseph Smith. Joe married a 14-year-old. He was a pedophile. First off, there's no evidence that Joe was a pedophile, so please, please stop saying that. The technical term is ephibophile, a person who's attracted to teenagers. Second, what does it say about Helen Mar Kimball, a human being with her own desires, her own story, flaws, and beliefs, when we just reduce her to an attack point against her victimizer? I've done it. I'm sure many of you have done it too. So let's correct our approach. Let's humanize this attack point and understand her story. Let's understand who Helen Mar Kimball was as a person instead of reducing her to a pithy jab. I'm going to send you to chapter 22 of Compton's In Sacred Loneliness in order to understand Helen's story. Also, Lindsay's Year of Polygamy podcast episode on Helen Mark Kimball is particularly outstanding. 
And like I said, all of us are working from the same sources because they're firsthand and they're incredibly revealing. Helen is one of the best documented of Joe's polygamist wives, and she left a lot of autobiographical information of her early life in Mormonism, including a detailed diary with nearly daily entries from 1884 to 1896, which was transcribed and edited with the help of Todd Compton into an over 900-page volume of A Widow's Tale in 2003. She wrote a lot. She spent nearly her entire life in the highest strata, the uppermost layer of the Mormon hierarchy crossed, a status that she enjoyed solely because of the men who she was joined to through family and through marriage. With that said, let's try to understand Helen as best we can from her own hand. She was born into the Kimball family as the only surviving daughter in August of 1828. The Kimballs lived in a little town called Monroe, New York. That's just about a day's journey from the organization place of the church in Fayette, New York. Her parents, Violet and Heber, had married in 1822, and they built a little, you know, farmhouse in that town. Now, the Kimball family and the Brigham Young family were very close. Helen Marr even sometimes called, you know, bloody Brigham Young's sister Fanny Young, Aunt Fanny. So, I mean, they were close from long before they were ever members of the church. So finally, in early 1832, the Kimball and the Young families came across a Book of Mormon, and they were converted to the faith. A year later, both of the families, the Kimball and the Young families, made their way to Kirtland, Ohio, where the church had recently taken up headquarters. Helen was a mere three years old when her parents were baptized into the church. Being an only daughter of a large family, it's very clear that Heber favored Helen Mark Kimball from her earliest days. The family was also reasonably well off, and Helen rarely wanted for food. From her own hand, quote, I remember the cunning little dishes and toys father would make for me, which I generously divided with my mates who were less fortunate, end quote. She also revered her parents as wise and pious. You know, she frequently remarked on how her parents seemed to be saints in her eyes. Now, she didn't share the same kind of penchant for religious aspirations. She kind of, you know, took the more of the approach of like a deathbed type conversion and thinking that that would suffice for salvation from her own hand again, quote, I used to think it impossible for me to ever become a saint. I looked upon my parents as such, but thought that nothing short of perfection could take us to heaven, which I could never attain to, as I was so fond of fun and amusement that I could not possibly give them up, though I often had very serious reflections upon the subject, and used to think if I could only know just a little time before I was to die, I might be able to sober down and prepare myself, end quote. Now Compton writes, quote, Like Zina Huntington, Helen remembered Kirtland as an idyllic time, and left descriptions of the beauty of the surrounding groves. At Sunday school, she wrote, I used to love to go and recite verses and whole chapters from the New Testament, and we received rewards in primers, etc. At 10 o'clock, we would form in line and march with our teachers up to the temple. Now, when Eliza Snow was baptized into the church in late 1835, Snow actually began teaching school in Kirtland for a brief period of time before the Mormon removal to Missouri in 1838. Young Helen was just hitting elementary school age at the time and attended Eliza Snow's schoolhouse, which was actually just a wing of the Kirtland Joseph and Emma Smith home. Now, in a rare example of the Book of Mormon actually being used for instruction, Helen actually learned to read using the Book of Mormon, among other common school books of the day, as a textbook of instruction. Now, when young Helen was only five years old, her father, Heber the Creeper Kimball, left with Joe and Bloody Brigham Young and nearly 200 other men on their mission to redeem Zion. And this mission was known as Zion's Camp. We talked about that way back in the way back episode like 28 or something like that. Now, Zion's Camp was the first military campaign of Mormonism. The camp itself, it completely fizzled out. But as a consolation for this mission incomplete, many of the Mormon hierarchy after that were called from participants in Zion's Camp. Heber Kimball was one of these guys called to the Quorum of Apostles. From that time forward, the Kimball family would enjoy elevated status anywhere that Mormonism had a presence. Heber was called on another brief mission in 1836 to the eastern states. Violet traveled to meet Heber on his return, and then Helen remembered their return back to the town, to Kirtland, when she was only seven years old. I'm reading this from Compton, quote, I remember the morning when Mother's sweet face peeped into the door. I was just kindling the fire, and 
how quickly I dropped the wood and flew into her loving arms. They had returned late the previous evening, and she could hardly wait till morning to see me. The first object that met my eye as we entered the door of our sweet home was my little brother, Horace, who had been very sick and was reduced in flesh previous to taking the trip, standing with both hands full of something to eat. My father had not yet risen, but our meeting was a joyful one. The wood fire was burning brightly on the andirons, and our old-fashioned tin oven stood before it filled with sweet apples, and Aunt Fanny Young was preparing breakfast." End quote. And then Helen, in the winter of that same year, 1836 to 1837, was baptized in Kirtland, Ohio, quote, from her own hand. I was baptized by Uncle Brigham Young in the branch of the Chagrin River, my father cutting the ice for that purpose. He and Brigham Young then belonged to the Quorum of Twelve Apostles, end quote. Later that same year, Heber the Creeper Kimball left for a mission to England, which didn't turn up any respectable number of converts, but it laid the foundation for the Quorum of Apostles to have a successful mission to England from 1839 to 41. The Kimball family was once again left alone in Kirtland without their father as Heber's prominence in the church continued to grow. He finally returned in May of 1838. Now, during Heber's mission out at this time, the church had undergone many problems and changes. The Kirtland Safety Society had been formed and had failed. Joe and Hinchpin Sidney Rigdon had absconded to Missouri in order to escape incarceration and all of the lawsuits that were piling up against them in Ohio. And Brigham Young and most of the remaining apostles had made their way to Missouri as well. And of course, rebel factions that were opposed to George's leadership, they had formed in Kirtland as well. The entire city of Kirtland, as far as Mormonism went, it was in turmoil at this time. And Helen was approaching 10 years old. And from what her own writings reveal, she seems like she was completely ignorant or insulated from what was going on around her. She departed Kirtland with her parents in July of 1838, writing, quote, when we started for Missouri, I was delighted, as children commonly are, at the prospect of a change. Although some of my little mates tried to frighten me with awful tales about being eaten alive by the Missourians who were cannibals with horns, end quote. When the Kimball family arrived in far west Missouri, a month later, they took a brief lodging in the home of the Pattons. Here, Helen made friends with David and Phoebe Patton, along with all of their children. They eventually moved into another small log home in downtown Far West. Now, David Patton was one of the few casualties of the Battle of Crooked River during the 1838 Missouri-Mormon War. Helen remembers, after befriending the Patton family, coming to the Patton's home when David had just been shot and had died, and she provided a brief sketch of the strength and resolve of Phoebe Patton at this time of turmoil. Quote, I can never forget her fearless and determined look. Around her waist was a belt to which was attached a large bowie knife, and she intended to fight if any of the demons came there. End quote. When Helen and the Kimball family f arrived in Missouri, the Mormons weren't long for that state. It was less than six months after they got there that the extermination order was signed by Governor Lilburn Boggs and the prophet, along with his closest acolytes, were imprisoned, and the Grand Mormon Exodus from Missouri to Illinois began. Now, during this winter of 1838-39, to 39, the Quorum of Apostles took the lead in coordinating this Mormon exodus. Bloody Brigham Young, with his right-hand man, Heber the Creeper Kimball, Helen's dad, took the mantle of acting presidents of the church while Joe and his other fellow leadership languished in various Missouri jails. While Heber and Brigham directed the affairs of the church and its members, Violet Kimball and Fanny Young took care of the Kimball and Young families. Helen remembers their journey from Missouri to Illinois, which began in mid-February 1839. Now, this journey was rough. The cold climate in Missouri winter made trudging through the snow a challenge, and every household harbored potential anti-Mormons, requiring the Kimball and Young families to take refuge in houses under false pretenses. Helen Mark Kimball remembers this, quote, The day we started from Missouri, the weather was terrible, and my mother and sister Young, with their children, stopped at a non-Mormon house and asked the privilege of warming themselves. They were admitted. There were no men, only women there, but they began talking about the horrible Mormons and eyed us very closely. Sister Young and my mother appeared to believe all they said and looked horrified, and we children imitated them, end quote. Another detail that Helen provides of this, you know, exodus from Missouri to Illinois was her older brother, William, who nearly froze to death. 
Now, William was riding on a horse in front of their caravan, and he fell off into the snow unconscious. Dr. Levi Richards was also traveling with them, and he saw this happen, and he jumped from his horse to go reanimate the teenage boy. So Richards ran up to William Kimball and rubbed him all over his body to keep the blood flowing, and then when William started to regain consciousness, Richards smacked him around a bit, making William, from Helen's own writings, quote, angry enough to fight, started the blood to circulate and saved his life, end quote. Frontier life. Glad we don't live there anymore. When the journey was over, the hardships truly began for Helen and the entire Kimball family. They were forced to make their way to building a small log home in Nauvoo while Helen, it was commerce at the time, while Helen's mother, Violet, was once again pregnant with a young brother to Helen, who they named David Patton Kimball in honor of the fallen warrior from the Battle of Crooked River. Now, the Kimball family suffered through untold trials as they built a new life in Nauvoo. Helen later remembered the picturesque Nauvoo with fondness in one of her biographical sketches, reminiscing about, quote, the green woods and hills and delightful views, and most of all, the view of the broad Mississippi where we could see and hear the steamers as they piled up and down its quiet bosom, those rich prairies covered as far as the eye could reach with tall waving grass and decked with wild flowers of various hues, end quote. The memory has a way of idealizing the past, even during troublesome times. And that's what she wrote about here. That's what we experienced in her reminiscence. She remembered Nauvoo with really kind memories, but she also recounts how poor the Mormons were and how rough life really was in a much less idealized version in her reminiscence. Quote, in the month of July, 1839, father, Heber C. Kimball, moved us up to commerce, soon to be designated Nauvoo. He pulled down an old log stable belonging to a brother Bozier, about one mile from the river, and laid up the logs at the end of the Bozier house, which had a number of rooms and contained several families. He put on a few shakes to cover it, but it had no floor or chinking. When it rained, the water stood nearly ankle deep on the ground. The chimney of the other house being built on the outside served us as a fireplace. My mother, not liking the dirt floor, had a few little boards laid down to serve as a substitute." I remember the evening of the 23rd of August, 1839. We were visited by a heavy rainstorm, and those boards floated on the water. My mother, Violet Kimball, had bread light and ready to bake in a tin oven or reflector, and it had to be propped up so as to bake the bread before the fire, which was built upon andirons. Under these peculiar circumstances, I was allowed to go and stop with one of our neighbors, and when I returned in the morning, I was informed that a little stranger had arrived that night. This was a truly wonderful event and created quite a sensation in our midst. He was named after David Patton, and although born in a stable, he was a prince in our estimation. This was their sixth child, four of whom were then living. Father purchased five acres of woodland from Hiram Kimball, and brother Parley P. Pratt purchased the same number of acres adjoining. They went to work and cut logs and invited a few of the old citizens vis-a-vis Brother Bozier, Squire Wells, Lewis Robertson, and others to assist in putting up their houses, as our people were mostly prostrated by sickness. Brother Pratt soon sold out his improvements and went with his family on a mission to England, end quote. Helen also includes in her reminiscences how sick the family was constantly with malaria in that first and second summer of Nauvoo life as they were, you know, draining the swamp, literally draining the swamp. And it's interesting, too, because this kind of reveals a little window into Helen's mindset. And it's a common mindset of her time. But Helen believed that severe sickness was caused by evil spirits inhabiting the hosts of the sick. Now, church leaders believed similarly as well, explaining why they frequently coupled like folk herb remedies along with exorcisms in order to heal the afflicted. If somebody had some kind of sickness, they were infected with demons. Now, Helen details when the malaria ravaged her family in her reminiscence. The Kimballs were even favored with visits from the prophet to help heal them from time to time. Quote, Father was building his chimney and had just gotten to the ridge of the house when he was taken down with chills and fever. The hardships and exposures consequent on being driven from Missouri in the winter had made the saints easy subjects for the ague to prey upon in that swampy country. Nearly all were taken down, one after another, and the ones who were not shaking or delirious with fever would do their best towards waiting upon those that were. 
Many had to see their dear ones die, and not one of the family able to follow them to their last resting place. Hundreds were lying sick in tents and wagons. The prophet visited and administered words of consolation, and often made tea and waited upon them himself, and sent members of his own family who were able to go to nurse and comfort the sick and sorrowful. He was often heard to say that the saints who died in consequences of the persecutions were as much martyrs as the ones who were killed in defense of the saints or murdered at Hans Mill. There are many living martyrs who remember those days, and some will yet wear a martyr's crown. The powers of darkness seem to have combined to put a stop to the work of the Almighty, but Satan's plans have always been frustrated and they always will be. One night, while we were living in the Bozier house, we were awakened by our mother, who was struggling as though nearly choked to death. Father Heber C. Kimball asked her what was the matter. When she could speak, she replied that she dreamt that a personage came and seized her by the throat and was choking her. He lit a candle and saw that her eyes were sunken and her nose pinched in as though she were in the last stage of cholera. He laid his hands upon her head and rebuked the spirit in the name of Jesus, and by the power of the holy priesthood commanded it to depart. In a moment afterwards, some half a dozen children in other parts of the house were heard crying as if in great distress. The cattle began to bellow and low, the horses to neigh and whinny, the dogs barked, hogs squealed, and the fowls and everything around were in great commotion. And in a few minutes, my father was called to lay hands on Sister Bentley, the widow of David Patton, who lived in the next room. She was seized in a similar manner to my mother. They continued quite feeble for several days from the shock. End quote. The sickness, you know, being cast out of Violet Kimball and then transferring apparently to the horses, to the children, to the hogs. Yeah, it's uh, well, it's nice that we have a bit more of a nuanced and scientific understanding of how sickness actually works. But he were the creeper Kimball eventually went with the apostles on their mission to Europe from 1839 to 1841. Helen remembers when they departed Nauvoo, leaving the Kimball family behind to make their own way in the ailing and destitute little town that was soon to become Nauvoo, that was still called Commerce, Illinois at the time. Quote, Although too young to sense the deep anguish which our parents felt, yet we children wept bitterly when our father came to bid us farewell, not knowing that we would ever see him again in the flesh. Both he and Brother Young were going away so sick they were unable to get into the wagon without assistance. The scene is so vivid before me that my eyes are blinded with tears as I try to write, but words fail to describe it. Our grief for a time was very great, but the knowledge that they were messengers of the Almighty to carry glad tidings to those who were in darkness, that they also might be partakers of the blessings of the gospel of salvation, sustained those who were left. End quote. Helen's memory of this time is vivid and detailed in, you know, concerning what transpired in Nauvoo. Her pen has proven invaluable in understanding some of the context of Nauvoo Mormonism and what the practice of sealing and celestial marriage looked like under Joseph Smith's leadership once Helen was targeted and marked by the prophet. Now, Helen has revealed a lot of her early life and her early teenagehood to the record of history. We should understand the perspective from which she wrote these memories. Okay, Helen Marr Kimball Whitney was a Mormon elite living in Utah in the early 1880s when most of this information that we're reading was initially written. She was daughter of the elite Heber the Creeper Kimball, who still has blue elite blood running through veins of members and leadership today. She was also sealed for time and eternity to Joseph Smith, the prophet, the ultimate sealing somebody could attain. And then she was resealed for time alone to her similarly aged Horace Whitney, who was son of Mormon elites Newell and Elizabeth Whitney. And the Whitneys, of course, were the first family to take in the Smiths into their home in the early Kirtland years. So what that means is Helen was poised as truly one of the most elite women of Mormon nepotism when she wrote most of her memories of Nauvoo Mormonism, because unfortunately she didn't keep a contemporary journal at the time. And also consider what was going on in Utah when she wrote this information in the early 1880s, right? The Edmonds Act had just been passed. The state was coming under heavy scrutiny by the federal government for their practice of polygamy. The government was about to begin seizing any property over $50,000 owned by the church. 
Many more mini elites, including Lorenzo Snow and John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, they were constantly in hiding, moving from safe house to safe house in order to escape the law. People were being arrested left and right because of cohabitation. Utah was trying to become a state, but was barred from gaining statehood until they outlawed polygamy. So, in all of that, that's the context that Helen was writing most of this information. She wrote her first pamphlet defense of polygamy in 1882 as a response to Joseph Smith III when he was prophet claiming that polygamy was never practiced by his father in Nauvoo. That's, of course, when Joseph Smith III was prophet of the RLDS Church, beginning in 1860. And of course, the second of her polygamy defense pamphlets was written just two years after the, her first one in 1884, titled, quote, Why We Practice Plural Marriage, end quote. And that was printed in Utah in the Juvenile Instructor. Now, with all that said, Helen died in November of 1896, living just barely long enough to see Utah become a state after the first manifesto was created and published by Wilford Woodruff in 1890, which put a hold on polygamy until the second coming. Needless to say, with all of that context for when this actual information is coming to us, her memory of Nauvoo polygamy and Joe's proposal to her certainly has some complex motivations and slants to it. It's also more than 40 years after they, it occurred, right? So with all of that said... The words and phrases that she uses to describe the doctrine and practice, at least in her reminiscences, don't read like a polygamy apologist, but sincere recitations of the passage of events as she remembers them. She's very clear and unabashed in her retelling of her teenage years in Nauvoo. She provides a very colorful perspective of everything that the marriage entailed, telling of her own frustrations and inner conflict stemming from the introduction of celestial marriage by her own father. Compton amply summarizes her writings of her, from her own memory and the practice of polygamy when he says, quote, Helen Mark Kimball is perhaps the classic example of a woman whose conversion to polygamy was difficult but complete, coming only after a period of severe cognitive dissonance, end quote. So Helen's interactions with Joseph Smith had likely been infrequent prior to 1843. Now, she had seen Joe and her father meet from time to time when Joe would come over to the Kimball house to conduct business or to speak with her parents for any reason or whatever the case may be. She'd obviously seen Joe preach repeatedly many times, right? She must have revered him as the holy and pious prophet the majority of the Mormons thought him to be. One of Helen's earliest memories of Joseph Smith comes from when Joseph Smith decided to visit the Kimball home sometime in 1842. Now, Joe was talking to Heber and Violet about some matter or another when he picked up a little doll that Heber had sent to Helen from Europe during his mission there, which happened a year and a half prior to when Joe came over to their house. Now, something or another happened with this doll while Joe was handling it, and the head fell off of the doll while it was in Joe's hands. Now, Helen remembers this scenario in her 1881 reminiscence and reports his reaction as typical Joe, and her reaction is simply priceless. Quote, he merely remarked, as that has fallen, so shall the heathen gods fall. I stood there, a silent observer, unable to understand or appreciate the prophetic words, but thought them a rather weak apology for breaking my doll's head off. End quote. <laughs> <laughs> quite an introduction for this 12 year old <clears throat> no that was probably sometime in 1842 the exact date isn't clear now at this time joe's ephibophilic attractions towards helen had likely engaged and she was marked by the prophet now sometime in 1841 to 1843 she entered the realm of having absolutely no choice but to acquiesce to joe's will once she was marked, Joe put a plan into play. His true intentions aren't made clear given the sequence of events, but it all ended with Helen being sealed to Joseph Smith, so it seems that he eventually got what he wanted. So I'm going to lay out the plan that Joseph Smith put into play, and then we're going to go through all of the documentation used to form the historical model that I describe in this plan. How it begins is Joe decided to test Heber and Violet Kimball. He wanted to know how loyal they truly were and then gave them an Abrahamic-style test. He told Heber that the Lord had given Violet to Joseph Smith to be one of his wives. 
Heber pondered it for about three grueling days and then eventually agreed. And when Heber and Violet approached Joseph Smith in agreement to his demand, he told them that it was all a test and that now they were to be sealed to each other. After Heber and Violet were sealed, Joe tested Heber again by teaching him about celestial plural marriage, telling Heber that it was necessary to enter into polygamy himself. Heber thought he would select the wives that he would take, but he was sorely mistaken because Joseph Smith had already designated who Heber's second wife would be. A short time after Heber was sealed to his second wife, Joe gave the Kimballs another test. He now wanted their 14-year-old daughter. Helen Mar Kimball, and they agreed. Heber taught Helen about the doctrine of celestial marriage, and she went counter to every cultural and visceral inhibition and finally agreed to be sealed to the prophet. Then she came under Joe's control and was barred from participating in the activities of her peers because Joe feared that a boy her age would snap her up, and Helen was very bitter about this fact. Then, a year after she was sealed to Joseph Smith for time and eternity, she became the youngest of Joe's widows when he was assassinated in Carthage. During this time, as she was living in Nauvoo, she also developed an attraction to Horace Whitney, son of Newell and Elizabeth Whitney. After Joe's death, she was married to Horace for time, as her eternity had already been spoken for by the prophet. That's the sequence of events in Helen's life as the best polygamy historians have been able to reconstruct. It's a bit dehumanizing, isn't it? It's almost as dehumanizing as attacking Mormon history by saying that Joseph Smith married a 14-year-old girl and then forgetting her name. What did she think of all of this? What was life like in the Kimball family as they were slowly initiated into the practice? All of this wasn't easy for Helen. We're going to read Helen's own words about her conversion to polygamy in a minute. But first, a passage from Compton's In Sacred Loneliness, in order to shed some light on Joe's Abrahamic test of the Kimball family. This is beginning on page 495 of the book. And much of this comes from Helen's son, Orson Whitney, who wrote the biography of Heber C. Kimball, published in 1888 in Utah. You're going to find a link to this biography on archive.org in the show notes, along with an Amazon link for Compton's book. This is kind of a long read, but it's expertly constructed and incredibly revealing, and all of the information is crucial to understand the coercive powers of the prophet. Quote, The first chapter in the story of Smith, the Kimballs, and polygamy is that of Violet's offering, which Orson Whitney, Helen's own son, recounted in his biography of Heber. In early 1842, apparently, Joseph approached Heber and made a stunning demand. Quote, It was no less than a requirement for him to surrender his wife, his beloved Violet, and give her to Joseph in marriage, wrote Orson. Heber naturally was paralyzed and initially unbelieving, quote, yet Joseph was solemnly in earnest, end quote. Heber's first impulse was to turn down the requirement with no further discussion. At that time, Orson surmised, he doubted Joseph's motives and the divinity of the revelation. For three days, Heber endured agonies. Finally asked to choose between his loyalty to Mormonism and his intimacy with his wife, Mormonism and Smith won out. Quote, then with a broken and bleeding heart, but with a soul self-mastered for the sacrifice, he led his darling wife to the prophet's house and presented her to Joseph. Joseph wept at this proof of devotion and embracing Heber, told him that it was all the Lord required, end quote. It had been a test, said Joseph, to see if Heber would give up everything he possessed. As so often with Joseph's actions, he had an Old Testament parallel in mind, Abraham surrendering Sarah to the Pharaoh. The emotional trauma Violet endured must have been indescribable also. Then Joseph married her and Heber for eternity and said, quote, Brother Heber, take her and the Lord will give you a hundredfold, end quote. This prefigured the next test for the couple, which was nearly as difficult as the first. Smith now taught Heber the principle of polygamy and required him to take a plural wife. At first, Heber thought of marrying two elderly ladies, the sisters Pitkin, who would cause Violet, quote, little if any unhappiness, end quote. But Smith had already selected Heber's first plural wife, Sarah Peak Noon, a 30-year-old English convert who had left an allegedly abusive husband, Mr. Noon, before her conversion and had two little girls. Heber reluctantly agreed. Finally, to add to the trial, Joseph commanded Heber to keep the plural marriage secret even from Violet, 
quote, for fear that she would not receive the principal, Helen wrote. This was the greatest test of Heber's faith he had ever experienced. The thought of deceiving the kind and faithful wife of his youth, whom he loved with all his heart, and who with him had borne so patiently their separation and all the trials and sacrifices they had been called to endure, was more than he felt able to bear, end quote. Heber was understandably worried that Violet would hear about the marriage from another source and balked at entering into polygamy under those conditions. Helen explained, quote, The prophet told him the third time before he obeyed the command. This shows that the trial must have been extraordinary, for he was a man who from the first had yielded implicit obedience to every requirement of the prophet. According to Orson, Heber was told by Joseph that if he did not do this, he would lose his apostleship and be damned, end quote. As so often, Joseph Smith taught polygamy as a requirement, and to reject it was to lose one's eternal soul. Once one had accepted him as a prophet, one had to comply to polygamy or accept damnation. End quote. That was Compton's reconstruction of events, and it reveals certain patterns and tendencies Joseph Smith employed to bring people into the practice of polygamy. First, a test of fealty. Once the person passed that test, then, Joe would begin a campaign probing into a deeper degree of coercion into something that person's morals were fundamentally opposed to. Heber and Violet Kimball had proven themselves church broke and willing to sell out their systems of Victorian morals in order to follow the word of the prophet. Church leaders today can say that there's no right way of doing the wrong thing, but Joseph Smith is the paramount example of that which is wrong under one circumstance may be right under another. When he commanded something to be done, it was done, often with the looming threat of damnation should his followers run counter to his will. When it comes to the Kimball family, sure, they enjoyed the utmost elite status in Mormonism throughout most of their membership, but that obviously came at a price. Joe threatened damnation. The Kimballs fell into line. Then it was time to really test how far Violet and Heber were willing to go. According to Todd Compton, he discusses Violet's conversion to the principle of celestial marriage, and he reports family folklore as follows, quote, Heber asked God to reveal the principle to Violet, and soon after she was allowed a vision of immortal joy in celestial plural marriage and saw Sarah Noon as Heber's wife. She came to her husband and said, Heber, what you kept from me, the Lord has shown me, end quote. Thus, according to or family tradition, whatever we want to call that, Violet and Heber had complete conversions to Mormon polygamy in spite of their Victorian predilections. But what about Helen, though? Well, we're lucky that Helen Mark Kimball left so much behind detailing this episode in her life. Even if it was 40 years after it had happened and she'd been living a life of polygamy for her entire adulthood. So, I'll let her tell the story for herself so we can further humanize this incredible and controversial woman of Mormon history. This passage comes from a letter that Helen wrote in 1881 to her children. The letter also includes the poem that I read at the beginning of this episode. And the entire thing is fascinating, and you'll find a link to it in the show notes. But a little preface to it real quick here. This is written in the context of Helen alone learning of the doctrine of celestial marriage. It takes place after Heber and Violet had gone through their Abrahamic trials and were practicing their celestial marriages. Sarah Peak Noon may have even been pregnant with Heber's first polygynous child at this time that Helen is remembering when she wrote this in 1881. Quote, Years passed away and we were living in the city of Nauvoo. Just previous to my father's starting upon his last mission but one to the eastern states, he taught me the principle of celestial marriage, and having a great desire to be connected with the prophet Joseph, he offered me to him. This I afterwards learned from the prophet's own mouth. My father had but one ewe lamb, but willingly laid her upon the altar. How cruel this seemed to the mother whose heartstrings were already stretched until they were ready to snap asunder. For he had taken Sarah Noon to wife, and she thought she had made a sufficient sacrifice, but the Lord required more. I will pass over the temptations which I had during the 24 hours after my father introduced me to this principle, 
and asked me if I would be sealed to Joseph, who came next morning, and with my parents I heard him teach and explain the principle of celestial marriage, after which he said to me, If you will take this step, it will ensure your eternal salvation and exaltation, and that of your father's household and all of your kindred. This promise was so great that I willingly gave myself to purchase so glorious a reward. None but God and his angels could see my mother's bleeding heart. When Joseph asked her if she was willing, she replied, If Helen is willing, I have nothing more to say. She had witnessed the sufferings of others who were older and who better understood the step they were taking, and to see her child, who had scarcely seen her 15th summer, following in the same thorny path, in her mind she saw the misery, which was as sure to come as the sun was to rise and set. But it was all hidden from me. End quote. This inner turmoil that the Kimball family experienced here, this was the carrot and stick of Mormon theology. Right, The greatest reward was to be sealed to the prophet in the eternities. The alternate resulted in eternal damnation. By virtue of giving their daughter to be sealed to Joe four time in eternity, Heber and Violet, along with all their subsequent wives and sister wives and children, they were all sealed to the prophet's eternal lineage, and their place was ensured in the celestial kingdom where they could go on to create worlds without number. That is why... Helen said this promise was so great because it sounds so good, an eternity of godhood, that I willingly gave myself to purchase so glorious a reward. It's the carrot and stick. Helen was given this 24-hour period to make her decision. But really, what decision did she have, though, right? Her parents had decided her fate. Joe had targeted her. Helen's path was already laid. Now it was merely left to her whether or not she would walk that path or turn her back on it and suffer the label of apostate in this life and damnation for eternity. Quote, Father left me to reflect upon it for the next 24 hours. I was skeptical. One minute believed, then doubted. I thought of the love and tenderness that he felt for his only daughter, and I knew that he would not cast her off, and this was the only convincing proof that I had of its being right. I knew that he loved me too well to teach me anything that was not strictly true, virtuous, and exalting in its tendencies, and no one else could have influenced me at that time or brought me to accept of a doctrine so utterly repugnant and so contrary to all of our former ideas and traditions." End quote. Because her father taught it to her. That allowed her to believe it. Had it come from anybody else, she wouldn't have believed it. She never would have consented to being sealed to Joseph Smith. Sometime in May of 1843, Helen was sealed to Joseph Smith, quote, a few months shy of her 15th birthday, end quote. Now she was spoken for. And Joe required Helen to no longer be in any social situation where she might be courted by any of the boys that were her age, which Helen became extremely bitter about, especially as she had already taken a bit of a liking to Horace Whitney, son of Newell and Elizabeth Whitney, from her own hand, quote, During the winter of 1843, there were plenty of parties and balls. Some of the young gentlemen got up a series of dancing parties to be held at the mansion once a week. I had to stay home, as my father had been warned by the prophet to keep his daughter away from there because of the black legs and certain ones of questionable character who attended there. I felt quite sore over it, and thought it very unkind act in father to allow my brother to go and enjoy the dance unrestrained with others of my companions and fetter me down, for no girl loved dancing better than I did, and I really felt that it was too much to bear." It made the dull school still more dull, and like a wild bird I longed for the freedom that was denied me, and thought myself a much abused child, and that it was pardonable if I did murmur. End quote. Those black legs and ones of questionable character, that could have been anybody, but most reasonably that could be referring to other teenagers who, you know, 
might take a liking to her, like Horace Whitney, or other teenagers that she may divulge her secret to, not understanding the gravity of what had transpired, what had taken place in Helen's own life. But soon after the sealing took place between Joe and Helen Mar Kimball, Heber Kimball went on another mission to the eastern states. And during this mission, he sent a letter to Helen. Um, she, she must have been on his mind and was likely exhibiting symptoms of anxiety or depression at this time. Because some of the words in Heber's letter here, well, just listen. You, you deal with it how you will as the listener. Quote, My dear Helen, you have been on my mind much since I left home. Learn to be meek and gentle, and always speak kindly to your dear mother and listen to her counsel. My child, remember the care that your dear father and mother have for your welfare in this life, that all may be done well, and that in view of eternal worlds, for that will depend upon what we do here and how we do it. For all things are sacred. Let us seek to be true to our integrity, wherever we shall make vows or covenants with each other. Now let us be careful that we do not make a breach, end quote. Yes, Heber Kimball had but one ewe lamb, as she said it, and this is what the offering looked like. Compton summarizes on page 500 of In Sacred Loneliness very well, quote, These lines present a bleak picture of Helen's mental state in the months after the wedding. A sickened heart broods. She is a fettered bird with wild and longing heart who pines for freedom every day. She must have been attracted to boys her own age, as would be normal. She certainly was already paying attention to Horace Whitney. The marriage to Smith coming so suddenly and blocking these growing feelings must have been devastating to her. These lines were the first evidence of depression in Helen Marr's life. Understandable, isn't it? When we consider her plight, right, she was plucked from the flock of her peers at a young, impressionable age and given the secrets of a criminal empire to keep to herself. If I can borrow from The Handmaid's Tale, a rat in a maze is free to go anywhere as long as it stays in the maze, right? Helen's maze was laid out for her, and from that time forward, she could only live within those strict confines. Now, a final point to deal with here is whether or not this marriage included sex. Look, this is a thorny issue, as it is with all polygamous marriages, especially the teenage ones, okay? Now, there's plenty of evidence that Joseph Smith was a sexual predator, even if we exclude Helen Mark Kimball, so this question shouldn't really matter all that much, but this question is important for some people and for some reasons, so let's touch on the issue. So if you don't want to hear about sexual assaults or this may trigger you for any reason, Maybe skip forward about five minutes. Okay. All right. I think we're safe. So the question is, would Heber and Violet have given their only teenage daughter to a 37-year-old man knowing full well that he was going to rape her? Yes, they would have. As is the case in most religious sects that include a patriarchal polygynous dynamic, this is common even today. What evidence would we expect to find from this Victorian era that this marriage included a sexual dynamic? None. There there would be none, right? We can only infer based on a few pieces of data. So, first datum. Joseph Smith was a sexual predator, and it's entirely plausible that many of his polygamous marriages involved a sexual dynamic. That's just an unequivocally true statement. Second datum. That comes from a late antagonistic source named Catherine Lewis, who claimed to be a friend of Helen during this time. Now, Catherine Lewis claimed that Helen objected to the marriage after finding out everything it included, like maybe being raped by the prophet, right? Here's the quote from Helen, um, uh, of Helen. This is what Lewis quotes Helen saying, quote, I would never have been sealed to Joseph had I known it was anything more than ceremony. I was young and they deceived me by saying the salvation of our whole family depended on it. End quote. Now, like I said, that's a second piece of data. It's a late antagonist to quote, and there are issues with some of the other content before and actual this line. Now, like I said, that's a late antagonist to quote, and there are some issues with some of the other content before and act after this actual line that she said. Third datum. Now, this comes from the change in Helen's mood and how worried her parents were with her well-being after the ceiling. 
Now, if the protectionist tone of Heber's letters throughout 1843 and also the poem that Helen penned are evidence of her general shift in mood, it really could imply that she suffered a series of traumatic experiences associated with this marriage, which is entirely understandable, of course. Now, the fourth and final point of data that I'll I'll discuss here used to determine whether or not sex was involved is a little bit complicated, but this comes from the 1892 Temple Lot hearing. Now, the Temple Lot hearing is complicated, but suffice it to say, a few of Joseph's wives were called to testify in court about their marriages to Joseph Smith. Eliza Partridge and Lucy Walker were both called to the stand and testified that they did indeed have sexual relations with Joseph Smith. The fact that Helen Mar Kimball was alive at that time and wasn't called to testify in that hearing lends itself to the possibility that there wasn't actually a sexual dynamic because she would have been a star witness for the church if she and Joseph had had sex. However, there's a qualifier on this, right? She was 14 when she was married to Joseph Smith, so her testifying in court that she had sexual relations, that she was raped by the prophet at age 14 in 1892 when Mormonism was being squashed by the U.S. government for their practice of polygamy, you think that probably wouldn't look really good. So maybe that's why she was not you know, called as a witness in the case. Now, there were plenty of other teenage polygynous marriages happening in Utah at this time, including of, you know, young young teenage women. The Utah Mormons probably didn't want that kind of attention drawn to their practices while their prophets and apostles were actively in hiding, escaping arrest. Okay. So there are multiple data points to consider here, but the resounding conclusion about the historical evidence from Helen that any sex was involved is that she never would have recorded it in the first place. Right? So when it comes to sexual assault, Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, especially when it comes to these private, life-changing, traumatic events, like being raped by the person who is regarded as the gatekeeper to heaven, who holds your eternal salvation in his hand, right? Helen was coerced and pushed into this marriage, and she had absolutely no control over the situation. Her life and her eternity were chosen for her, and It would have been her fault if she abandoned those choices that she had no hand in making for herself. Only damnation awaited those who denied such proposals. So now that we know some of Helen Mar Kimball's story, and trust me, folks, we barely scratched the surface. Maybe we can take some lessons from her writings and experiences. Maybe one day, Helen Mar Kimball will be more than just a common attack line against Joseph Smith after erroneously calling him a pedophile. So, I'm going to go ahead and let Helen Mar Kimball take us out for the night. Quote, I can truly say that I feel an interest in the welfare of all. And if some of the incidents of my life could impress the minds of others as they have my own, I would feel amply repaid for writing them. There seems to be a great curiosity in the minds of strangers about the Mormon women, and I am willing, nay anxious, that they should know the true history of the faithful women of Mormondom. In the brief sketches which have been given from time to time, the trials and sufferings of the Latter-day Saints have scarcely been touched upon. Thank you, Helen. That's going to do it for today. We also have some announcements, so don't go anywhere. Coming up this next, with this upcoming weekend from when this is airing. This is going out on everybody's podcast feed at the evening of Thursday the 11th. On the 14th of April, 2019, I'm going to be in St. George 
at Room at the Square. The address of that is 175 West, 900 South, St. George, Utah, beginning at 2 p.m. that Sunday, April 14th. I'm going to be giving a talk. It's going to run somewhere between 90 minutes to to two hours. It's going to be just my, you know, a little bit of my story, my own personal pathway into doing what I now do for a living about, you know, Mormon history, podcasting. And also I'm going to be presenting my newest research on the Smith and the Agent Theory on whether or not and to what extent psychedelics may have influenced early visionary Mormonism. So if that is something that would interest you and you're in the southern, southwestern Utah area, or if you want to travel down to St. George on April 14th, once again, it's going to be a room at the square, 175 West, 9th South, St. George, Utah. But that's not all. Sunstone Symposium and Short Creek is coming up. Now, Short Creek are is known as kind of like the two, the twin cities of polygamy, I guess, in Hilldale, Utah and Colorado City, Arizona. This is just, you know, about 30 minutes outside of St. George. Sunstone is happening April 26th. That's on a Friday, but there's weekend events for the entire weekend that are going to be happening, service projects and all kinds of really cool stuff. You're going to find a link to the show notes at sunstonemagazine.com for their upcoming symposia. One of those is the Short Creek Symposium. A little rundown of what you can expect. Tara Musser and Lindsay Hanson Park are doing the welcome and orientation. Then there's going to be a big panel presentation on the Short Creek Mission. And there's also going to be a presentation by Shirley Draper on the FLDS Trauma and Resilience. And then the keynote presentation is going to be D. Michael Quinn presenting on the history from 1886 to 1912 on the FLDS faction, which is going to be so fascinating because, well, D. Michael Quinn... A, he's an amazing historian. B, his studies into polygamy are, well, his his articles and books in the history of polygamy are vast and prolific and quite incredible. And any presentation that he's going to be giving on the practice of polygamy, especially during the manifesto period, oh, it's it's going to be fantastic. So if you want to attend Sunstone, I'm going to be there. I'm probably going to be doing interviews for most, if not all of the time while we're there. That's going to be at the Home Sunday School, H-O-L-M Sunday School in Hilldale, Utah. And if you sign up on sunstonemagazine.com by clicking in the show notes or by putting that into your search browser, you can get the exact address emailed to you when you sign up to register. And you can also get, you know, you know, a purchase the dinner or purchase the the uh, Saturday morning driving tour, the history tour of Short Creek. It's going to be an amazing experience. And I have it on good authority that <laughs> the, the type of um, presentations that are going to be there are unlike any other sun- Sunstone Symposium. So if that's something that interests you, check it out. Also, last week, I believe I told you all that I'm planning on doing co-hosting interviews with Colleen Dietz of Mormon Happy Hour podcast. Now, if you don't listen to Mormon Happy Hour, what's wrong with you? It's it's my favorite Mormon podcast in the world. It's fantastic. So unfortunately, Colleen was unable to make that. So much like me, she funds all of her attending Sunstones and going to conferences and stuff through her Patreon uh, her Patreon page where she publishes videos of her her podcast interviews and everything. Um, but unfortunately, she's had a couple of people drop off and she cannot quite make the ends meet to make it out to the Sunstone in Shore Creek. So unfortunately, she had to cancel. So with that in mind, if you're looking for an awesome new podcast in Mormonism, uh, especially with current events, especially with the reversal of the November policy, maybe consider hitting up Mormon Happy Hour. It's a really awesome podcast. And like I said, it's my favorite Mormon podcast. You know, I consume a lot of podcasts. Very few of them are actually Mormon podcasts, but Mormon Happy Hour is one of those that I never miss a single episode. So yeah, might not be a bad idea to check that out. But also, we do have a bunch of new patrons to thank. I'm kind of surprised to say this. We have new pledges at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism by Kevin, by Jay Kim, by Tyson, and by Leslie. And those four new pledges are bringing us ever closer to our next goal. And our next goal is how to talk to missionaries, what to talk about, who, you know, how to engage in the conversations, how to be respectful, how to break through barriers so you can talk to missionaries. So that is our goal. And we're actually surprisingly close to that. So if you want those extra episodes for patrons, go sign up at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism, throw a buck a show to me. You know, it's a subscription service, but what you're doing is funding research and funding, getting this 
information out there because that is my job, reporting on Mormon history. And you'd be surprised, it's kind of time consuming. <laughs> but all of you should know that. So all of that said, I want to, of course, thank everybody for tuning in, for hitting the download button. If you can't support on Patreon, uh, if you can't leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcasting app of choice, you still hit the download button. You still hung out with me till the end of the episode. And for that, I thank you so much for lending me your ear. I hope to talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast. This podcast is produced with help of Julie Briscoe as social media manager, Brian Ziegenhagen as audio engineer, and Andrew Torres of the Law Offices of P. Andrew Torres in the Opening Arguments podcast as legal counsel. Music is written and performed by Jason Camo of a aloststateofmind.com and used with permission. Naked Mormonism is a production of Ground Gnomes LLC, copyright 2019, all rights reserved. Why does BYU still have accreditation? <laughs> I mean, so I don't know if you're listening to this in the backlog, maybe this is a story that's long since blown over. Maybe this is something that you're not even paying attention to. But right now there are Instagram, there's this meme going around of Instagram stories of people who have been punished by the honor code office. So I I guess a little background here is necessary. So the honor code office was something that was instated, I don't know, probably in the, the 1950s or 60s or something by the BYU dean or leadership or something to that effect. And basically, it's set to police the conduct of the attendees at BYU. Now, this is an accredited university. Now, granted, it's a private university, which apparently means that it can do whatever the fuck it wants, right? That's how private works versus public. Um, But it's still, I mean, it's publicly subsidized. All universities are publicly subsidized, whether they pay less in taxes, whether they don't pay property taxes, or, you know, they they get government subsidies for education funding, whatever the case may be, right? So there are tax dollars going to BYU, but they can just openly discriminate based on religion, right? Um, You can attend BYU without being a Mormon, but you have to have an ecclesiastical endorsement of some sort from a faith leader in order to... Uh, attend BYU. They just want to make sure that all the students are good, upright, honest citizens. Um, But you can't drink coffee. You can't drink alcohol. You can't have any sort of premarital sexual relations, even that even includes like dry humping and petting and necking. I know those are terms that non-Mormons, non-ex-Mormons probably don't know what those are, but those are Mormon terms, petting and necking, that's straight out of For the Strength of Youth pamphlet. It was never described to me exactly what those are, um, but you assume petting, it's like, you like pat somebody on the dick, is that how that works? Is that petting? Uh, <laughs> um, you know, like, they're, they're general terms that are just like, oh, scandalous, um, but <laughs> it's like this is a a university. How can we take a university serious that thought polices its students? Because that's what it ha- what it comes out to be, right? These ecclesiastical endorsements mean that your religious leader and overwhelmingly those are Mormon bishops say that you're okay to be attending a university. This is supposed to be an institution of higher learning, and they are letting people who have beards get in the way of that. Right. So, so uh, uh, if you wear something that is not approved of, if you are wearing, um, if you're a woman and you're wearing something that shows your shoulders, you can be called in for an honor code violation. 
If you are drinking coffee on the campus of BYU, you can be called in for an honor code violation. If you are a man with a beard, you can be called in for an honor code violation. And you get so many strikes against your record, and then disciplinary action is necessary. And each strike is weighted appropriately according to the degree the infraction is. Um, you know, I assume that wearing a, a um, you know, a tank top, a woman wearing a tank top or a guy having a beard is probably a pretty minor infraction. But the greater infractions are like violating curfew or, um, you know, being a man in the woman's dorms or vice versa after hours. Oh, we can't have that. Um, so all of these are honor code violations and they're weighted appropriately. And obviously drinking alcohol, that's pretty high up there if you're, uh, having premarital sexual relations. That's a pretty heavy violation. And what that can mean is you are expelled. What enough of those honor code violations uh, amount to is that you can be expelled from the school for so much as being seen on campus too many times having a beard. That's fucking insane to me. I mean, am I crazy in thinking that a university shouldn't be able to expel people because they have facial hair? Am I the crazy one here? What I mean, isn't that the entire idea of going to a campus, of going to an institution of higher learning, is to expose yourself to broader ideas, to, to concepts and fields of knowledge and study that you never would have been exposed to had you not gone to this university or to any university or any other institution of higher learning? Isn't the entire idea to create more well-rounded and more holistic human beings? But as soon as they question the leadership of the church as soon as they don't receive their ecclesiastical endorsement meaning you know they that can mean any number of things right you have to have that ecclesiastical endorsement renewed i, I think what is it every six months or every year meaning that you have to actively be attending church and you actively have to meet with your bishop once a year in order to get him to sign a piece of paper that says you can still attend byu now, if you happen to not believe in the church, if you happen to be questioning the church, if you happen to have, have had premarital sex and your bishop knows about it, if you happen to, if you give a blowjob or if you eat out a chick <laughs> and your bishop knows about it, you can be expelled. How the fuck do we take this seriously? I, I mean, why does the school have accreditation, right? And you know what? The, the thing is, is like, I'm just talking right now. I'm just thinking about these things out loud. Um, there are probably an entire subset of rules and, and laws and ordinances that are governing private educational institutions that don't seem to comport with rational ideas, right? That, that just seem to be very counterintuitive, but they are allowed to do it because it's a private educational institution. Um, but how far does that line go? Um, if my education institution, if I run a, the, the religion of cannabis and my education institution requires every single person to smoke cannabis, um, can I expel a student for not smoking cannabis? Um, it's religious liberty. It's my religious freedom that everybody who's a member of my cannabis church has to smoke cannabis in order to be a, a member and in order to get their <laughs> their canoclastical canna endorsement. I'm, I'm, I coined that term, canoclastical, right? In order to get the endorsement to be able to attend, and if they violate any of the bylaws by not smoking weed, then they get expelled. That's that's cool, right? It's my institution. It's my religion. Oh, the government doesn't recognize the religion of cannabis as a legitimate religion because it's not Christian. The religion of Jesus weed. That can be a thing, right? I, I, I mean... I can scarcely craft a hypothetical that doesn't fall within the Victorian cultural mores of Protestant Christianity that we all kind of deal with every single day that doesn't boggle my mind. That doesn't seem to be like, wait, what are you talking about? Because it's like it, it, it's a version of Christianity. It's a religion that gets a special exemption because it is a Christian religion because it is so powerful, because it was built in the theocracy of Utah. We don't get to question it. We don't get to say, hey, wait, so you're going to expel somebody for having a beard? You're going to expel somebody for wearing a tank top? Um, why? 
Why? You're going to expel somebody for having an offensive bumper sticker that says damn on it? You're going to expel somebody for drinking coffee too many times? I mean... I get it, right? I get that there are probably laws in place that allow that to be acceptable. That doesn't mean it's rational. Plenty of things that are culturally acceptable are not rational. And all of that leads me to question, why is BYU taken seriously as a school? Why does it have state accreditation? Um, there's a couple of sit-ins that are organized. And, you know, the first sit-in happened at BYU, Idaho, I think today that I'm recording this, this is the 10th. Uh, it's still too early to tell if anything happened. I haven't seen any headlines about it. I haven't seen any reporting on what happened there yet. I haven't even seen many stories about it. Um, and then coming up uh, the day after this, Ayers is going to be a sit-in at the BYU Provo Honor Code office. And all of this has been spurned by the Honor Code Stories Instagram stories, right? People have been posting uh, their experiences with the Honor Code office and what so many of them come down to is women saying, I was raped and then I was expelled because I uh, was told that I committed a sexual indiscretion. That's what a lot of these stories are. Or um, I went on a date, uh, you know, a uh, uh, young man going on a date with another man getting expelled for that, right? So that's what a lot of these honor code office violations are actually coming down to. Um, is punishing people who are victims and punishing people for expressing any version of sexuality that falls outside of the cis hetero expression that is, you know, explicitly um, prescribed in the church um, because all others are proscribed, right? It's disgusting. It's disturbing. And the stories are countless of how many people have been expelled because they violated the law of chastity because they were raped. So that's cool, right? Um, you know, HCO needs to go. It really does. It, and the, the, the BYU office just released, uh, you know, the, the acting director since January of this year uh, released a, a p press release through the BYU news office that answered frequently asked questions and it's pure propaganda used to shut down these protests before the protests even happen. But I'm looking forward to seeing what happens through these sit-ins. The HCO needs a serious reform. The honor code office, if I haven't used that, uh, that acronym yet, um, the HCO needs to go. It's these protests need to make something happen. It needs major reformation or it needs to be completely and utterly abolished. Um, because this is this is immoral, this is incomprehensible, and what it amounts to is a university group of people who have no actual specialized expertise in uh, trauma therapy, uh, very little training in QPR tra um, QPR uh, referral services, you know, very little training that you would expect somebody who's working in that sort of capacity to be able to deal with the subjects and the objects and the people that they are dealing with. Um, it, it's, it's unconscionable what's actually happening. It comes down to people who don't know what they're doing dealing with sexual assault and dealing with things that happen on college campuses that shouldn't be happening. And a lot of that can amount to just shoving it under the rug. It's pretty gross, pretty terrifying. I got to say, I would not want to be a woman attending BYU right now because there's no recourse for you. There's no, nothing you can do. Yeah, Colleen Dietz of Mormon Happy Hour has shared a few times her story of sexual assault at BYU and how she's had to deal with it, right? Her story is one among a sea of people who have been uh, whose voices and whose liberties were quashed by the honor code office. It is immoral. It is an immoral practice. And, you know, I'll, if anyone wants to educate me on how a private university is able to, you know, retain something like an honor code office and still retain their uh, accrediting, their accreditation, please inform me, you know, get in touch with me, send me a message or, you know, post up in the comments section of this because I truly cannot wrap my mind around it. It should not be happening. It's just so 
counter to what we consider rational and moral. It's, it's abhorrent. It's disgusting. It is deplorable. Um, you know, I, I really hope that some action, uh, results from this. I really hope something comes of this because Jesus, uh, people are being hurt every day. People are, are suffering every single day. People are being traumatized every day and the HCO is just pushing them under the rug, getting rid of them, uh, destroying their voices, their voices of opposition until they graduate. And then the HCO never has to deal with them again. BYU never has to deal with them again. And then those people go on about their lives. They forget that spell or that time in their life at BYU that something bad happened to them and, or they, that, that whatever happened to them, uh, causes them trauma and PTSD and anxiety and depression for the rest of their lives. They're forever damaged. They're forever scarred because of this, because they were victimized and, um, BYU never has to pay for it, uh, never has to pay for it through monetary or through reparations or through changing policy, changing practices. So something needs to change. If you see the Instagram stories of honor code office violations or, you know, of honor code office, uh, what, what people have experienced there, you'll see very quickly that there's a pattern emerging that there are problems. Uh, change needs to happen. Not today, not even yesterday, years ago, change needed to happen years ago. It's taken a long time. It's just, just one more example, right? I mean, like the, the BYU campus police, they were just, the, the lawsuit just went through that they now have to comply to the same information laws as general police, uh, offices do. Um, that's cool. So like slowly and surely we're dragging BYU into compliance with the rest of the laws that the rest of secular society has to deal with. This is yet one more of those things where you're, you're we're going to have to drag BYU kicking and screaming with a bunch of public opposition with, with a bunch of public protests. This is the beginning of a transition. It's the beginning of a new phase of opposition to BYU. It's going to be a long fight. There's going to be a lot of tears shed, a lot of picketing, a lot of people mad, a lot of sharing on social media. What will come of it? Eventually, the HCO will change, it will adapt, or it will be abolished, and no apology will ever be made. Who knows if that'll happen uh, in a few weeks, in a few years, in a few decades, or never. That will be coming at some point. I don't think never is when. I think a, a change will happen. We're just going to have to see when, how, and why it happens. Uh, just keep an eye out. Honor Code Office, that's going to be our next big story in Mormonism among so many other things going on. So it's just interesting, man. It's the mill just never stops giving and just never stops churning out interesting shit every single day. Isn't it? I feel like I could do a daily show on, on Mormon culture and Mormon headlines and never run out of material. Uh, that's never going to happen. Every two weeks is good enough. We can focus on the stories that really matter. Uh, but this feels like a story that's going to matter. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Of course, every two weeks I'm referring to glass box podcast. If you don't listen to that. Eh, I don't blame you. Hardly anybody does. <laughs> it's more of an outlet for me personally. I just like to get the information out there and I don't talk about it on this show anymore. So yeah. Um, of course I'm going to, uh, stop bugging you guys. Uh, stop bugging y'all, all y'alls. Uh, thanks for hanging out with me. Thank you so much for your support and Take care, everybody.